for a great day. What beautiful weather we've been having over here today in the UK. It's been absolutely beautiful, although we can't enjoy it to the fullness because of the lockdown, but it has been nice to see such great weather. And uh, welcome along to the show. I've got a very special guest with me tonight, representing Newcastle from the Magpie channel. I've got Matty. How are you doing, Matty? Hello, mate. Good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good, man. Just a rare day off for me during this lockdown. And like you say, lush weather. Even up here in nearly Scotland, as you would think, uh, it's, it's still degrees and we've still been enjoying it as much as we can, really. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's been really nice. Sorry, mate, we've got a little echo on your thing. You might have to turn your volume down a bit. Turn the volume down. Turn your volume right down. Yeah. Right down. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's sounding better. That's sounding better. So, yeah, Matty, um, what have you been up to since this whole coronavirus thing? Uh, well, the previous job I was working, we got obviously got like furloughed, but kind of let go. Uh, they couldn't really afford to keep on, so there wasn't much work before even the whole corona thing happened. So, right as it was like really early days, I took a job with the NHS 111. Oh, so, wow. it's been a position since February, really, like mid February when. The government, everyone wasn't really taking the coronavirus seriously. Um, even some of the instructions we were getting given was a bit was a bit mad, really, from WHO, the World Health Organization. And then obviously, as it developed, they knew what to say. So yeah, I mean, it started off as a weekly rolling contract, and nearly three months later, we're still yeah, we're still working. I was still doing like five, six days a week, um, and it, it's good, you know, it gives you it gives you something to do. I, I think I'd be losing the plot if I was stuck in the house all the time. So to mm. get out of the house, socialize a bit with people at work, have a bit of a laugh and then obviously help people who call in it's it's all good really so you're dealing with a lot of calls um that are coming in to, to sorry you're still you might your volume's still a bit too high I'm still getting a bit of feedback there, a bit of echo uh my volume's really low on here like you really low mm -hmm. i don't know what it is i can try plugging in headphones or something yeah try plugging in headphones there slightly I've got a slight echo on here and uh, I don't want to lose the effect, but I think, you know what, um, it's great that we've got Matty on tonight because we're going to be discussing um, some things to do with Newcastle as well. So get, I, and I already can see lots of questions coming in from you guys, so I know he's going to have a lot of questions to answer regarding uh, Newcastle. We're just waiting on him to get his headphones there. Setting himself up there. We're just waiting for him to set himself up. This is live, man. This is how we do it on the live. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's sounding better already. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. You hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. Okay, bro. You can, yeah, that sounds a lot. I know your volume has dropped down a little bit now, so you can probably, you know. Yeah. But I can, uh, yeah, I can hear you um, without the, uh, the echo now. So, yeah, just so I was just going back to that. So in your job, then you're having to deal with lots of the calls that are coming in regarding coronavirus. Then. I think that's what it is, Robbie. It's the uh, NHS 111 helpline. So if you think you've got symptoms, you want any advice on the coronavirus, any information about it, you call us. And there used to be a couple of call centres across the country dealing with it. But now we're the only one up in Newcastle. So any call. When you hit NHS one on one and go through the coronavirus line, we'll come through to, to our office. That must be it. Must be ridiculously busy there. <laughs> Sometimes, but you'd be surprised. That a lot of the time, it, it's fairly quiet. But a, a lot of the times, there is mad busy spells. It just depends, really. So, like the other day in the news, it broke that the loss of taste and loss of smell was a symptom. So yeah. everybody who was thinking, "Oh, I've, I've had lots of taste, I've had lots of smell," they start ringing up, and everyone's understandably paranoid or worried about it. So then that's when it can be very busy, you know what I mean? So how do you give them, you know, I'm really intrigued by this. So <laughs> you know, how do you how do you stay calm and give people advice? Because the people must be ringing up and must be in a right panic, you know, really worried that they might have it. Mm -hmm. There is, I, but that's that's part and parcel of the job. You know, I suppose you've just got to try and keep your composure, um, know what you're talking about because the knowledge is there. You've got all the information on your screen of, of, of what to say, what not to say, that type of thing. So you just, you try and, Put yourself in the caller's shoes, really, and uh, you know what I mean. Sympathise with them, empathise with them, and, and try and keep them calm. And uh, you must have had some people where they've rung in, and you said, "Listen, with what you've told me, you've got to get to the hospital or something." 
Yeah, well, ma- mainly there's to self isolate with coronavirus, but a lot of the time we do have to press them through to, to 999. You know, you do get quite a few emergencies where they're struggling to breathe because if, if you've got coronavirus badly or if you're over the age of 65, underlying health conditions, that's when it affects you most, your breathing. So you can hear people gasping for air on the phone. You know, it's not nice, but you've got to be there. You've got to get them through. You've got to try and get the get the ambulance there as quick as possible. Wow. Well, listen, well done for doing that job, man. Yeah, I mean, you're... You're right on the front line, you know what I mean? It's people like you that are, that are keeping us going right now, you know what I mean? Doing such an important job, so that's brilliant. And um, obviously, like, football returning now, um, I'd love to get your views on what you think of that. I mean, um, at Watford, there was three people that tested positive. One of them we've heard now is Adrian Mariapa, is one, like one of their players. I think the other two are staff there. But Mariapa's... Uh, and I think also Ian Wone, who's... Uh, um, assistant manager to Sean Dyche at um, Burnley, he's tested positive. But would you look on it overall and say, for the amount of people there, it's not a lot when they, you consider they tested over 748 people um, to do with the Premier League clubs? I think that's it. I mean, you've got to look and you, you think, what, half a dozen tested positive out of nearly seven, 800. You've got yeah. to think, albeit you'd still want negative, but that's an ideal world. It's not going to happen. I think to keep it below double figures... It's quite remarkable, to be honest with you. And you'd pray that professional athletes would recover to the, to the best ability. You know, it's, it's not always a given. The mm. thing that stuck out with me, to be fair, mentioned in Watford, was uh, Troy Deeney. And Troy Deeney was saying he was going to refuse to go back to training because his young son or daughter, was it? Yeah. He's five years old, has got health problems. Yeah. That rings true to me. And that just shows, you know, football as a human, you know, is it the right thing rushing them back to this crazy time, the crazy world we're living in at the minute? Yeah, I mean, it, it is crazy. And, and the, the, the crazy thing is about, I was reading what Mary Apple was saying. And he was like, he said he's in shock because he said he's had absolutely no symptoms at all. Mm. He's not felt sick. He's not felt, n- none of the things that you've described that people, when they're re-ringing you up and gasping, he's not, he said he'd been training, he's been fine. And yet yeah. he's got it. It's just like, he's obviously um, asymptomatic, so... But that's the that's the worry with this thing in a way, isn't that's it? The, you got that's exact, uh, it. Nothing's they're fine. Mm-hmm. I, I was looking at it, I was like, I could have it. I, we don't know yeah. do we? until we got proper testing it. That's why that's why the lockdown was so important and should have been done earlier, really, because you think of the events that was happening. You think of the Liverpool Athletico Madrid game, you think of Cheltenham. There could have been hundreds, if not thousands, of people in that in those arenas with coronavirus, not knowing it, passing it on. Someone else passes on, and it's just a it's just an end and vicious circle. Do you know what I mean? Where it gets passed to someone who is over that age bracket or does have that condition where they can't cope with it, whereas me or you or a footballer may be all right. You know, it's it's mm. going to affect someone in a, in a negative way. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible, and obviously now it's looking like football might be coming back. Although you know there have been leagues like Scottish League who cancelled their league. Um, I'm reading today that the the women's football league looks that looks like that's going to go as well, mm. but um, it does look like we're going to get our league started back probably towards the end of June. You you happy about that? Do you think that's the right thing? I mean, when you're on the front line, so you shouldn't. You know, you're you're seeing it firsthand more than we are. So, uh-huh. I mean, for me at, at this point now, when we're when we're nearly getting to June, you you start to think. It's not going to start until the end of June. You start to wonder, well, what's the domino effect on that? Like, how are they going to compete the, the Champions League? How are they going to finish the FA Cup? When's the next season going to start? It just seems like it's getting to that point now where it's too late in the day to start it. For me, I was all for it. You know, after a month, I was like, nah, you can't have football behind closed doors. It's not the same. And then now you, you, you're gagging, you're desperate for a game of football, aren't you? I mean, even the Bundesliga on the weekend was great to watch, um, mm. even though it was, it was nothing like the same. But with it being the talk of the neutral venues, or even if it's not, if it's still behind closed doors, it's just not going to be the same as it, Rob. I mean, how would you get that excited for it? Like the Bundesliga, I think, felt like a pre-season tournament. It felt like you were watching, you know, like the pre-season tournament in Germany or something. But it's better than nothing, I suppose. But it, obviously, it has to be safety first. But the Premier League were always going to come back with the, with the TV money. They were never going to cancel the season. Um, so hopefully, we'll get, we'll get, we do get it back. Everyone's all right. And we're going to enjoy what could be like what a game every other day. I mean, it'd be great back. It'd be great for our YouTube channels, but as long as everything's in place to make sure the players and everyone else are safe, then let's get it done and let's get it wrapped up quickly and hopefully we can get back mm. some normality in football towards the end of the year. And I think, had I asked you this question a couple of months ago, 
and said to you, do you want the season to come back? You'd have probably said to me, no, nah, it's all right. Just <laughs> avoid it, cancel it, we're done, right? But mm. now, all of a sudden, as this guy here says, this comment here, um, he says, Mr. Arsenal says, Newcastle, New City. And of Cheers, course, Mr. Arsenal. <laughs> and of course, that's because you guys are on the verge of uh, this takeover. I mean, David Waller also says, Newcastle United takeover deal worth 300 million close is it going to happen is this deal where the saudis are going to take over newcastle is it going to happen or will it be haughty because they've been taught that um you know because of some of the stuff that's gone on with saudi arabia that uh human rights and stuff like that that you know that the premier league might not grant and grant them but money talks isn't it i mean it's gonna happen robbie i mean the premier league money talks all right and especially now when they need investment more than ever. And this new investment from the Saudis is going to only bring a new competitive edge, hopefully, for Newcastle fans at least, introduce more new, better world-class players into the league, potentially a world-class manager into the league from abroad. It's only going to bring a new entertainment factor to the Premier League. Newcastle being another club that will hopefully be challenged towards the top end of the league. I think it will go ahead. A lot of Newcastle fans are getting impatient now because we've been hearing it's going to get done every Friday for the past month. Um, we're going into, what, the sixth week next week. But you've got to remember Southampton's was the last club to take over, I think, or Sheffield United. Both of those took eight weeks. So we've still got a couple of weeks left. We've got to remember that the Premier League are going through the toughest decisions ever at the moment with Project Restart um, and everything else that's going on, a worldwide pandemic. You know, it's it's not going to be an overnight thing. But we hear on tonight on Twitter and everything, Newcastle sources here are there and everywhere. Our local paper the Evening Chronicle are reporting that it's been given the green light today. It's been given the go-ahead by the Premier League. Wow. An announcement can be expected by the end of the weekend. So, fingers crossed, Robbie. No more Mike Ashley. You're going to miss him, though. Thank God. Oh, I, I will miss those back-to-back relegations and no ambition and signing players for free. That's, we'll definitely miss that. I <laughs> Signing players for free, is that a sign of it, then? Because that's what <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> You want to hope he doesn't come and invest in Arsenal, are we? <laughs> so, how long has he been there? 13 years. It's quite ironic, actually. It's uh, 13 years to the day this coming Saturday. So it'll be poetic if he leaves on the day this coming Saturday and he gets replaced by one of the richest uh, richest owners in the world. When he first came in, Mike Ashley, were you... I don't know if you can remember when he came in. Was you enthusiastic? Were, were Newcastle mm-hmm. fans thinking, yes? Because I remember... Who was it before? Was it Sir John Hall was... Yeah, yeah, he was there before and he, he was starting to get on a bit shaky ground with the Newcastle fans, weren't he? He was. I mean, Sir John Hall, ever since he, he sacked Sir Bobby Robson, really, in 05 and replaced, and replaced him with Graham Souness when Newcastle was sitting challenging for Champions League and he sacked Bobby Robson. I mean, there was rumour uh, dressing around bust ups and things like that, but he, he lost the fans from there, really, and he was getting a bit, the club in a bit of a debt. Mike actually took charge and Mike actually won the fans over straight away. He was pictured mm. at Arsenal. He was pictured at the Arsenal away ground. It was the first game he had in charge. Yeah, he had a beer in his hand, didn't he? Yeah, his beer in his hand. He had the Newcastle top on. He was buying everyone beers on the quayside in Newcastle. Um, you know, his daughter was up here at university. You see, it was like a dream come true. This rich British man, he, he sport, he's a Spurs supporter, actually. Um, yeah. who's, who's, took over, who's took over Newcastle, who, who wants to take us back to the glory days. He brought back Kevin Keegan. You know, he got rid of Sam Ali. He brought back Kevin Keegan. And then it all came tumbling down. You know, he was appointing his best friends from the casino to run the club who hadn't had a clue about football. He, he was, wasn't was listening to Kevin Keegan who wanted the same players. He was signing players off YouTube. It was just a shambles. I mean, it, it's, been, it's been 13 years of an absolute mess and a disgrace, really, of Mike Ashley. All he's done is use Newcastle for his sports direct signs and his billboards and free advertisement. And we've suffered ever since, really. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, uh, lots of comments coming in. Uh... Leo David says uh, Newcastle are only considered a big team in Newcastle. <laughs> uh, what have you done compared to Man City before the takeover? But I don't know. I don't consider that Newcastle is only considered a big team in Newcastle. Mm-hmm. I feel that if you were to speak to most fans around the country, they know Newcastle is a big team. They know that that's a, when you the word sleeping giant. That is a sleeping giant. Yeah, and these guys are gonna un. It's a bit like uh, when you're playing a computer game. They <laughs> have money to unlock 
the joint. Oh, GTA code. <laughs> They're gonna unlock the cage, and that joint's gonna come roaring out. I mean, you must be you must be happy with this. We are because I mean we've. I think we are a sleeping giant. I think we are a big club. I mean, we were the nearly men of the 90s, weren't we? You know, the entertainers, uh, runners up in the league, FA Cup final after final, always losing at the last third. And fair enough, nobody remembers second place. But I think the fan base, the stadium, the history from years back, the European years of Champions League football and whatnot. I think, I think we are a big club. We're a very special club, a unique club. And with the right investment, we've always been on the edge of something special. So if someone comes in and does invest a bit of money, it doesn't even have to be the Man City's level. You just look at what was rightly done at Leicester and where they went, you know, and where they still are now and still climbing. So you, you look at these Saudis who are taking over, it seems like a dream come true, doesn't it? Too much money, so much money, they don't know what to do with it. So hopefully we do become the next Man City because I think if anyone deserves a bit of success, it's Newcastle fans. So you, you, now I want you to answer this question, right? Consider this like you've got a lie detector. On, yeah, so think like you've got a lie detector on, so you must tell the truth here. <laughs> Have you ever in the past had a pop at Man City fans and said that every and Chelsea fans and said that you know what, your success has been bought, it's all plastic? Have <laughs> you ever said that to those fans, or have you said no fair play? You know what, they've worked hard and deserved it. I think this, uh, this chair will be buzzing. Now, if I said no, like Robbie, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the first the, the first one for me was Chelsea because that was like the big shock, wasn't it? That was like yeah. foreign investment, pumping money. And especially with Chelsea, it was a new player every day. It was Carvalho, it was Robin, it was Shevchenko. It was every day there was someone new coming through the door mm-hmm. and they just dominated. They just dominated. They blew everyone out of the water for a while. You see Mourinho coming, it was like a new, new world of, of football, really. With the Man City one, it was kind of, I think football was getting that way anyway. Because you even look at the amount of money that Man United have still spent, even since Fergie left and they've done nothing. Mm. Um, with Man City, what you're still, you're still jealous because I think Newcastle are a bigger club than Man City and they were better and bigger in the table. Facts before Man City got taken over, you know. But what the Man City owners have also done to the community, which I'm sure the, the new owners of Newcastle have, have highlighted that they'll do, you know, hospitals, care, schools, everything, infrastructure, training ground, academies, the lot, they're going to invest in that. And I think that's that's one of the best things I've seen at the Man City one. And you, if you're not going to whinge at Man City and you're not going to whinge at Newcastle, you'll be whinging at someone else. You know, you get the quarterfinals against PSG in the Champions League, you'd whinge against them. Real Madrid have always flashed the cash. You know, it, it's the way football's going and I don't think Newcastle will be the last club to get taken over. Robert, to be honest with you. Newcastle used to be, uh, everybody sort of likes their fans. You know what I mean? Oh, we like the Newcastle fans. <laughs> And you, you'll find a lot of fans are like that when you're looking at a team and say, yeah, because we always beat them. But like, we like it. <laughs> but now, that's all about to change. Yes, Because mm. these these guys here, I mean, you talk about, you're on about Abramovich. You said about Man City. These guys, I mean, well, I think even our, our owner, our owner's worth about, I think they said about just under nine billion, which, don't get me wrong, that's ridiculous amounts of money. How much is the Saudis owners worth again? 270 billion. <laughs> <laughs> 270 billion. Yep. <laughs> wow. Baller, Ray. Baller. <laughs> Jesus. 270 billion. And they were trying to buy our Man United before Newcastle, yeah. weren't they? They were, but. Apparently, they didn't like the way the, the, the Man United lot were negotiating, whether whoever it was that turned up. They said they were disrespectful. They said they were pushing for two, three billion. You think you could buy Newcastle for 300 million? You can have a lot of investment. You could, we, aren't, we beat Man United this season, probably. So they say, let's let's go and get above them. You know what a touch that would be after after the, the stick they give us in the 90s with Kevin Keegan and all that? 300 million is not doesn't seem like a lot either. Nah, you know, it doesn't, does it? In the grand scheme of things, does it? But I mean, mate, actually bought the club for 130. Do you think he's he's what doubling, tripling his money 13 years later? All the money's pocketed. I mean, Robbie, we haven't seen the 35 million that Andy Carroll got sold to Liverpool for in 2010. That's really? a, that's a, you know he's never reinvested that money. So the amount of money he's pocketed and put in his back pocket, he's in a fortune to Newcastle United. And I think the one good thing to come out of coronavirus is putting Mike Ashley out of pocket because his other businesses have just totally stumbled and failed. 
the sports direct, the other high street brands, he needs to cash out now. So it's been a blessing for Newcastle fans. I wonder if that, you know, I mean, there's been a lot of Arsenal fans saying, will this be the same sort of thing for Stan Kroenke? The fact that, you know, he owns a lot of clubs. He also, you know, has got this massive investment um, that he's got at the moment with the LA Rams over there in um, America, where he's like building a new stadium and he's having to pump loads of money. Will that force him to sell? But I mean, the Saudi owners, you've definitely hit the golden goose. There's lots of comments coming in, by the way. Um, JB says Newcastle deserve this. Um, they um, have had to put up with probably one of the worst owners ever in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. um, Liam NUFC is obviously a Newcastle fan. He says uh, no more tra training in wheelie bins and no <laughs> more for kids paddling pools. Right? Did you see that? Did you see that, Robbie? Like another mate, Ashley Era. We've had the the mate actually thinks it's acceptable that Newcastle players have ice baths and wheelie bins. That's the that's the post recovery for Newcastle. There's trick. There's pictures all over Google. You have to go check it out. Newcastle players in paddling pools and in wheelie bins. That's their version of an ice bath. Sports direct ice baths. <laughs> uh, no more of those, like you said. Uh, Nobby says, uh, imagine the tune with serious money invested. We have a valid reason to be worried indeed. I mean, I'm asking Arsenal fans that tonight. Are we Should we be really worried about mm -hmm. Newcastle? I mean, uh, funny thing says uh, Newcastle will finish above Arsenal. I mean, should we be worried, Matt? You, you, you're, you're there. Should we be worried about Newcastle? Honestly, I, I really think you should. And Robbie, you know I'm not just saying this because I'm on your channel and we get along. Arsenal are my second team. They always have been way before all this. But I think you should be definitely worried because you're in a position where you don't get the investment you need. Year after year, you, you're two, three, four signings away from competing for the league. Yet every year, you don't make them. And it's the same frailties every year for you. We don't mind playing Arsenal. You know, we've had a good record against you at home, apart from I think, the last one or two games. Before mm. that, it was two or three wins in a row. We've never had a good record at the Emirates, but we always feel like you can give you a game if you're up for it, if you get in your face. Your defences freelies have always been there. You've finally got a what a decent keeper. I mean, you've got a good strike force if you keep a hold of Aubameyang. But you need, you you really need a good couple of hundred million put into this squad. I don't know how our is going to work out. It could be a very shrewd appointment. It may feel. Time will tell. But I think the main thing is that in the Premier League, you need money right now. You need investment. And you're only going to drop further without it. Right, wow, that's <laughs> worrying. Uh, <laughs> Jabo um, says, uh, "Sorry, Michael um, says, uh, Jabo, we've got the American Mike Ashley." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and then this guy, Tech Conscious, says, "But why bloody Newcastle? Why not Arsenal?" For his sake? <laughs> it's funny to be fair. It's it is. I mean, Keg, the lad who I do the channel with, he said. Why didn't they pick a London team? He was honest. He was thinking, what made them pick Newcastle? You'd think they'd oh, maybe try and go for a London team. I think it's because, you know, Amanda Slavery, who actually broke out the Manchester City deal as well. She has the connects in the Middle East. She nearly sold the club in 2017. It fell through. She's been trying ever since to find the right buyer. And she's obviously sold them this, this picture of Newcastle about the sleeping giant, about the history, about the city, about how it can grow, about how it, it could become the next big thing with the right money. So you've got to look at it, Robbie. You've got to look at St. James Park. It's an amazing place. I think Newcastle is an amazing city. Like I say, it's unique. It's one of a kind. Within two seasons with the right investment, we could be in the Europe League. You could be top five, two seasons. Another, another couple of years, you could be Champions League. So if you're in it for the long haul, if you're in it for four or five years, you've got to look. I mean, why, why did the Sheikhs buy Manchester City? Let's be honest, Manchester City were nobody before they got taken over. Mm. Nobody, nobody even knew there was a... I bet you the Sheikhs didn't know Manchester City even existed. You know, they would have just thought it was Manchester United, one club in Manchester. So mm. there's, there's one club in Newcastle, there's one club that play in black and white. And hopefully with the right ambition, you know, we can really go somewhere. Yeah. Um, DJ TV says, Cronky can get a loan off the Saudis. Mike actually <laughs> really dangerous. Also, he says he's a parasite. Um, so not, not a lot of love for Mike Ashley around at the moment. Um, Adela says, uh, Arsenal on mid-table. Isn't Cronky's uh, not going anywhere? Um if we want to change, boycott completely. Talk the talk and walk the walk. Wake up, Arsenal fans. Don't turn up at games and don't buy merch. Well, we won't be there for a little while. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still going to be going. So, you know. I've, I've, I've got to say, right, what the best thing that's going to come out of this takeover, because the guy there just mentioned the fact of don't buy merch, don't do this. It's been horrible being in Newcastle sport for years now, Rob, because 
the amount of grief we get for in, in, so for example the first video when this kid got released and I was wearing it where did you buy that from where did you get it from you better not have bought it from Sports Direct you better not have bought it from the club shop you better not be putting money in mate Ashley's pocket you couldn't do anything Robbie you couldn't go in the bar at the ground at half time you couldn't buy paints you couldn't wear the merch you couldn't anything you, you know even going to the games you've seen it first game of the season mm-hmm. this year when you had us on and we boycotted the game we, yeah. we did that as a stand against mate Ashley you know the best thing about this takeover is we're going to have our club back Hmm. We're we're gonna. It's not about. It's not even about the money. It seems like dreamland for Newcastle. We would have took anybody, but Mike Ashley and fighting relegation. If we can get the Saudis and we can get a, a whole ton of money to, to push up the league, then brilliant. But at least Newcastle can have a bit of pride and and go back to St James's Park where you held held high now. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, but d- d- you know, on that, you know, what I mean, because what what that guy was suggesting there, I, and obviously you know the problems that we're having at Arsenal at the moment, and. Our owner gets criticised for not putting money in. Although, to be fair to him, last season he did put, you know, a bit a bigger investment in that he normally does. But he gets criticised for not investing in the club and that as well. Now, there's been a lot of fans that have said, right, you know what? We want a new owner. We should boycott. We should all the things you just said. But does it work though? Because you know, like you said, Mike Ashley, he was there for 13 years, and the only reason he is up in sticks and selling now is because he's been given a ridiculous offer but and he's making a ridiculous amount of profit but does it work does all these boycotts not buying the shirt not buying a drink at half time does it really work i think it, it, it took a long time for it to work because we how long have we been protesting against mate ashley and but, but the cross the past year or so we've really stamped it up a level you know we've been i'd say the sports direct shops protesting has made national news that kind of affect him, his outlook, his stakes and shares in sports. Right? That kind of make that look good. Um, it's bad coverage for himself. Every game. I mean, look at this year. The boycott. 10,000 fans being given free season tickets in January because it was the lowest attendance at St. James Park for decades. Because of the stand that, you know, we in the summer gone, you had fans that had loyalty points in the hundreds for away games. You know, fans who have been going there for 20, 30 years. It's given to turn the back on a club that they love in stance of Mike Ashley. So in the end, I think all these things have, have nibbled away at him and finally got him to leave. But does it work? I mean, it takes a while and it takes a lot of effort. It, it might be easier with us with having the sports directly aim at, but I think at the Emirates, you, you could definitely try and voice an opinion. You know, you and troops and that get together and try and get Cronky out. You, you, <laughs> just, you, just, you, just, you just could try and do it. You should try, Robbie, because Arsenal yeah, shouldn't, yeah, yeah, shouldn't yeah. be where you're at. You ain't going to listen to troops, that's for sure. <laughs> we over here in America. Uh, Mohammed says, um, I'm from Saudi Arabia and I'm tired of people talking about human rights. Now, this has been um, something that has come up a lot where a lot of fans are like, well, hold on a minute. You know, Saudi Arabia got a bad record on human rights. Why are Newcastle taking some people have this, you know, they've said it's blood money. You know I mean? I'm not saying it is, I'm, you know, I, I don't know enough about it, but, you know, that that has been a criticism that is already getting levelled at Newcastle. And I'm sure when they take over, will, you know, um, will be levelled. I mean, how do you feel about that? Do you think morally it's right to do this still? I mean, I think he would know better than us exactly what's going on in, in Saudi Arabia. But what you hear from the press is that it is behind in the times. There is still awful things going on there. I kind of, I kind of say it off my own back. I've, I've got no idea. It's just the things you read. But, but for us, I mean, Newcastle fans didn't get to choose. Mike Ashley's the owner, so why should we get to choose the next owner? You know, we're not here to support Saudi Arabia, support whatever's going on over there. We're here to support Newcastle United. So that's it at the end of the day. I don't see how football fans should be given the blunt of the blame when, when they have no say in anything. You know, how, how often do we say we're so important, we're everything, the game is nothing without us, yet we don't get included in anything, do we? So no matter who buys the club, whether they be from Saudi Arabia, whether they be from Stoke on Trent, if, they, if they've got money and they've got ambition, then that's all Newcastle United fans want to hear. Not neglecting anything that does go on in Saudi Arabia, but it's not exactly Newcastle United fans' fault or we're mm. not going to make the difference, are we? Yeah, because Murad, <clears throat> Murad says, uh, Magpie TV, what do you think about the things um, that MBS has done in Saudi, like the Kosoji, um, which is that one gets highlighted a lot, the Kosoji yeah. murder, etc. Well, you've seen you've seen his uh, his widow there right in the Premier League, apparently. And again, you know, innocent until proven guilty. You've got the footage of him going into the Saudi embassy and apparently he doesn't come out. 
apparently that was, you know, Prince Ben Salman's order. It, it's all apparently, there's apparently that, like I say, innocent and proven guilty. You kind of charge someone on allegations, whether it happened or not, whether it was him or not. Again, we have we have absolutely no control and no say over that whatsoever. Yeah, I so think... I mean, what 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 can we do in Newcastle about that? Mm. Obviously, you feel for his video, you feel for what's happened, whether it was him or not. No idea. But again, it, it's it's we're on the other side of the world. Yeah, just supporting supporting by our local football club. It's we we kind of change the camera. Yeah, you know, I was I was chatting to somebody about this the other day, and they were like, "Oh, I think the government will stop." this deal from happening and stuff because of the Kosoji murder. And I was like, well, hold on a minute. I go, Saudi Arabia, I've invested in half of London. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. For starters, right? Got, so it'd be very remember of this well. guy turn around and say, well, you actually, you can't invest in Newcastle. What about all the other, you know, half of central London is yeah. owned by, or, you know, a Saudi Arabian company. So that if would it's be good enough for, you know, if it's good enough for you to see all these photos of Prince Bin Salman, with Boris Johnson, yeah. with the Queen, which he, yeah. what, he kind of stands oh, yeah. in his park. Do you see what I mean? So if it's good enough for the government, it's good enough for the Queen, I think it's good enough for the average Newcastle fan to accept him into the St. James's Park. No, it's all your fault, Matt. It's your fault. <laughs> it's all my fault. My bedroom in Newcastle. Um, B says, I'm from Saudi. Newcastle should expect big things. We have a local Saudi prospect that Newcastle should buy called Anna Himar. I could and imagine, I could imagine the owners wanting someone to maybe represent Saudi Arabia. Give him a shot, Ruby. Give him a trial. Goal. Saudi Arabia edition. Um, this guy says, uh, he's a uh, coach, Jordan. She says, Everton spent tons. Don't think Newcastle will attract good players. Mm -hmm. Yet it will take two seasons at least and too much change can be bad. But oh God. I, I don't know, man. I don't know. Whether I, I mean, what do you think to that? You know? Yeah, well, I think, um, no, we will that, come to Newcastle. I mean, there's one thing that will make you go anywhere, and it's this. Exactly. You, that's that's the. I kind of get my head around that. Oh, it's too far up north. No one will go to play there. Absolute bollocks, Robbie. Anyone will play anywhere for money. Anyone will play anywhere for money. Especially you look at what will be linked with like Cavani and Coutinho players that are, especially Cavani, for example, free in the summer, waiting to get the last big paycheck. These Saudis come in. We'll give you three and a grand a week. Where's Newcastle? Don't care. I'll take the money, thank you. He's, he's, he's going to be. He's going to snap your hands off for that end of offer. Uh, he's right in terms of Everton have wasted money. But that's why you try and bring in someone who's wise and spends wisely. I think Everton spent a lot of money on average players, to be honest with you. So it's the risk you take. Money doesn't guarantee success, but hopefully it doesn't guarantee us fighting relegation every year. <laughs> this guy, Arjun says, and back <laughs> the mighty Joe Linton taking the entire Premier League to the cleaners. <laughs> Imagine. It's great on players like Joe Linton, isn't it? <laughs> he's out the door with Steve Bruce straight away that's the other thing so come on let me get, yeah let me ask you about that now if he, the Saudi Arabians take over I've heard a lot of talk about um, Pochettino and things like that but Steve Bruce has been doing a decent job this season that's not going to be fair in it to get rid of him well firstly I would say keep Jordan on give him a chance and uh, better coaching Steve Bruce you're right very harsh if he, if he gets let go I mean he's got Newcastle to the first quarterfinals in the FA Cup for, for 10, 12 years since Mike actually took over, actually. Mm. Um, he's doing a great job. What was 13th in the table? Where he'd expect with our budget, if not a little bit better, to be honest. He's doing exactly what Rafa did. Although, when you're a Newcastle fan, you go week in, week out, with road will look this season a lot, Robbie. It's been a lot of last minute goals. We've got the FA Cup quarterfinal, sounds great on paper. We had two extra times against uh, Oxford and Rochdale. You know, we had replays against those clubs. So, it hasn't been plain sailing. The main thing is, is that if you're going to try and attract big name players, who's going to pick up the phone to Steve Bruce? Or who's going to pick up the phone to a Pochettino or, or another top class manager? Even if Rafa Benitez came back, that's where you got to look at it. Like, no disrespect to Steve Bruce, he's a local man. I think he's, he has done very well with the tools at hand. But if we're going to push on the next level, bye bye, Brucey. You see how look how they got roofed. <laughs> I mean, you got roofed already, man. They're changing already. They're changing. Uh, I, <laughs> says, uh, "Hi, Robbie. Um, did you know that Cronky has a 500 million um, ranch in Texas, where LA and New York City combined are smaller than the total area? The man has 30,000 cows, but won't show up." <laughs> <laughs> He's a very, very rich guy. You know what I mean? But um. Maybe that's why he is rich, because he doesn't seem to want to spend a lot of his money at Arsenal. And again, mm. he's been there for a very long time. Um, Mr. Rotten says, do you really want to be owned by the leader of a homophobic and gender-abusive country? 
<laughs> Again, I mean, I, I don't I don't know much about Saudi Arabia, Robbie. I'm here in Newcastle in England. Uh, all I know is I want my football club to do well. So I didn't want to be run by Nike, Ashley, put it that way. I didn't want to be run by Mike Ashley, who put British workers on zero-hour contracts and had so many trips to the hospital by in the sports direct warehouse, abused staff, ran our football club into the ground, ran the city into the ground. He's just he's a he's a dictator in himself, mate. Actually, so where we're not in control over football fans. Uh, Con says, uh, "Who would you sign first for Newcastle?" Oh, do you want a silly answer or a realistic answer? <laughs> well, you know, you got your owner's worth. You just told me two hundred not billion. Everything's realistic. <laughs> I think for me, uh, I think for me, what we should do is sign Jack Grealish. We should sign a young English talent. And try and build a team around him. I mm. think even even Jack Grealish early on, you say money, but I mean Man United and Spurs have been linked with him. They can offer European football at the minute. I would try and I would try and get Jack Grealish. It would be linked with Gareth Bale. It would be I think a big Mark Hughes signing. You know, someone who's too busy playing golf in Spain. His time's up at Madrid. Bring him back to the Premier League. He's still got a couple of years left in him. It'll be linked with Philip Coutinho, who you know has been struggling since he left Liverpool. Really give him some regular game time back in the Premier League. Any of those three. Someone who can score goals, Robbie, because that's where we're lacking, aren't we? Look at these big names that man's mentioning, man. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> thing says, I agree. Newcastle won't attract big players straight away. Uh, City went through a stage with players like Ilano, Petrov, Rubinho. Rubinho was a big name when they got him. Huge. huge. Big, before they kicked on. Remember, when they got Rubinho, Rubinho was hot. Oh, and I, you know what? No one could believe the same thing. That's another example of how you can sign it because he didn't even he didn't know nothing about Man City when he went there. He just literally went there because they were able to pay him ridiculous wages. Um, exactly. Shrey, Robbie Cronky is like the Corona. Oof. He said oh. for Arsenal. He said Cronky is like the Corona for Arsenal, and the Saudis' oil money could really sanitize this great club. Uh, Cronky out, Claudine. He says, <laughs> Claude, big old Claude. Um, and as I said, 22 says, why can't they buy out Kroenke? This isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mally Wright says, hi, guys. Uh, Arsenal should be, uh, should be worried not only about Newcastle, with other wealthy owners looking to invest in football. If Leeds get promoted, they're a sleeping giant who could um, be taken over. And that's true. And the, you know what? And then there's very rich owners at Leicester running the mm -hmm. club very well. There's very rich owners at Wolves running the club yep. very well. Everton have been taken over by, you know, um, you know. so, I mean, Omar says uh, Liverpool and City are miles ahead of us. Um, and with Chelsea, United, Sheffield United, Leicester and Wolves all better than us. And Everton and even Newcastle hot on our trails. We are in trouble. I mean, Arsenal fans, how are you feeling about this? I mean, you know, it's real. It's, you know, you've heard what Matty said. This is happening. You know, I know there's been a lot of people saying that it might not happen. This is happening. Um, Matt is saying this could be as soon as Saturday that this will be announced. And come next season, that means that, I mean, if you're doing transfer daily up there in Newcastle, that's going to be mm -hmm. exciting thing to watch. Finally get we'll some views back. <laughs> you're going to get linked to everybody. everybody. Uh, yeah, nah. yeah, literally, mate. Literally. We'll take be taking Obama Young like is that straight, I mean. Well, you know what? I, I, <laughs> I said to uh, my mate of mine the other day that they could get a Bamiya. They could, could come in, in the summer and they could say, a Bamiya, you're on £200,000 a week at Arsenal. We'll double it. Mm. Because there's that even talk about the financial fair play is going to be relaxed. That means it would be the perfect time for them to start moving and getting some of these big players. I think uh, you could look at, Robbie, you could look at when Man City obviously took over. They, they took off. Uh, out of Iora off your hands, didn't they? Yeah. They took, uh, yeah. they took off, you know, like Gareth Barry. They, they got these players, Craig He's... Bellamy even, they got these players who were decent at other clubs, progressed yeah. them. You could do that in Newcastle. Newcastle could sign like a Callum Wilson from Bournemouth, uh, Martinelli from Arsenal. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's <laughs> taking these players. B.A. <laughs> no, that's where the future. <laughs> He's the future, that kid, Martinelli. Yeah. <laughs> that's when absolute meltdown will begin at Arsenal. Trust me. That, that's when troops is outside kicking off, isn't it? When Martinelli goes. Having <laughs> <laughs> uh, Graham says uh, Newcastle United should sign Alexis Sanchez, Andres Pereira, Jesse Lingard, Marcus Rojo, 
and Phil Jones. Well, I don't think they're going to be nah. shopping. They're not going to be shopping for them sort of players, man. They're going to nah. be... You know, nah, not happy with that. Yeah, really. nah. if, you've got owners, if you've got owners, right, that are worth over 200 and odd billion, they can buy anybody. Yeah. The reality is exactly. they could realistically buy anybody. They can go along to a player... And they can even if even if everything's not in place yet, they can say, right, we want you to come. These they can lay out their plans. They can say, these are our plans for the next five years. These are the sort yeah. of things we're going to be buying. These are the sort of things we're going to be doing. We are we're the richest club in the world, and we we're going to really be go aggressive. So, do you want to be part of this or not? Exactly, and that's obviously what Man City did to get Rubinho, isn't it? That's what they must have done to get Rubinho. Yeah. You're you're the first of many, Rubinho. Um, yeah, Trent Singh says, Robbie, it's all doom and gloom at the moment. Um, can we do a current combined 11? Um, if not, um, it makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you could do a current combined 11, but after that, you know what I mean? That, you know, I don't think that same 11 will be there nah. next season. You know what I mean? A lot of them, a lot of them will be gone. Um, yeah. This guy says, hey, Geordie. <laughs> That's a nice <laughs> one. <laughs> you know, hey, Geordie. Um, do you think you're overhyping your club? Even with the new owners, <laughs> with the new owners, calm down your shit. <laughs> uh, we are shit. We are shit right now, but that's why we're hating the new owners because we're not going to be shit for much longer. <laughs> mm. I think. Uh, I think. I don't think we are. To be honest, I've just said realistic signings. I think Grealish, Callum Wilson, teams in and around us, pluck out their best players, take them away from us, push us up the league. I mean, you only need to look at Wolves. Look at what Wolves have done with a great coach and great investment. They're in the Europa League now already. They're only in the Championship a couple of years ago. Hmm. Shows where you can go. Nathan Roy says, uh, Robbie, we've been average for the last 10 years and we're still being average for, and we'll still be keep being average for the next 10 years. Um, the hard truth is always bitter to swallow. I mean, you know, can't argue with that, can you? Can't yeah, you, you? At least you've still had some FA Cups in a, a quarter final, uh, a yeah, final in the Europa League. Yeah. Listen, if you like them Saudis coming in, yeah, I don't think... Do you, listen, the Saudis coming in, you win a couple of FA Cups, they'll be happy with that because they'll be get like, bored. great start. But yeah. you telling me in 10 years' time, if those owners are there and any manager that's just delivering the FA Cup is going to get sacked. Yeah, they're absolutely. Gonna be, yeah. They're going to be ruthless and driven to mm -hmm. want to bring the league. You know? Yeah, it's levels, isn't it? It's levels. It's levels. It's what's next, isn't it? You're always looking for the next goal. You see yeah. with Man City now, they've, they've had a few Premier Leagues, the board, the chase in the Champions League. Yeah. Um, one love AFC says, Robbie, maybe Jeff Bezos can oh, buy Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a lot of money. I don't know, no man. I think I'd rather have the so uh, the Saudi owners than even a Jeff Bezos. I don't know. I think the I don't think these American owners sometimes they operate a little differently to some of like the Saudi owners will just come and splash. Yeah. Even if Jeff Bezos is going to be looking at profit and loss. True businessmen, aren't they? They're always thinking of margins and that. The, the Saudis yeah. just treat it as a toy. Um, now, I don't know if you feel sorry, but um, this guy, uh, Nico Berg, has got a question for you. He says, <laughs> how do Sunderland fans feel? Oh, dear me, Robbie. Have you seen Sunderland today, Dad? <laughs> I've seen it. Have you seen it? Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> to be fair, on, on one hand, you're laughing, and it's karma because they did that when we went down a few years ago. Um, but on the other hand, it could have easily been Newcastle and the Mike Ashley. It really could have. I mean, we had two relegations. Thankfully, we came back about the first time of asking. We know it's a difficult league, though. They have found that out. Now they're in League One. On this hand, I feel sorry for them. And on that hand, I'm laughing my head off. So, <laughs> but, but hold on. Let me ask you this, Matt, yeah? Wouldn't you rather them be up in the Premier League, though? I think... You know what, right? You know, yeah, the... You can laugh at them and they're down there in League One and you're laughing at them and stuff like that. But it's better for rivalry, though, if they're up in the mm. in league, surely. I think so, because I think when the fixtures get announced before the season starts, the first one you look for, well, me anyways, used to be Sunderland. It used to be your derby day. Because it's not just about the match, it's about the build-up, the afters, everything. The week leading up to it, the crack in the office with Sunderland fans, you know, family, friends, everything. It's just like, it's a right laugh. You look forward to the game. Recently, Newcastle had a terrible record against them. So, I'd welcome them back to the Premier League with these new owners so we can fashion them 5-6-0, absolutely. 
<laughs> um, Leona says, uh, hey, guys, as a big fan of women's football, it sickens me that people like these who treat women terribly and their human rights issues can buy a team. So Leona's, uh, Leona, they're making, you know, she's not happy with it. And there are a lot of women have been saying, um, saying a similar thing. You know? uh, I mean, you've got, to, you've got to look as well. A lot of people don't realise. I mean, a thing came out the other day about the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia, what they've invested in. They're the majority shareholders in Facebook, Uber, Walt Disney, all these different things. So whether you like it or not, that, that's, that's the world we're living in, unfortunately. And it goes back to money talking. You know, not everything's morally right in the world, unfortunately, especially financial-wise. If you look at any billionaire, you'll be able to dig up something dirty about them, I'm sure. Okay. Um, David Orchard says, uh, hi, guys. Uh, love from the Isle of Wight. Um, Arsenal will be the most affected uh, top club from this takeover because of lack of investment. And mm. there are a lot of uh, um, Arsenal fans saying that. And uh, Hacks27 says, uh, we're probably going to get new owners too. That Dan Gotti guy, uh, who's... Uh, Dan Gotti is the richest guy in Africa, and he is a massive Arsenal fan, and he's been saying for quite a long time he wants to buy Arsenal. He wants. He, he even came out and said he's going to buy Arsenal in 2021. Um, but it's if the Cronkies want to sell. And at the moment, right. it doesn't seem to be anywhere near. I mean, they now own 100%. Recently acquired the whole 100% of it. Why would they want to sell? Um LOL, LOL says, uh, well, Sunderland destroyed New Newcastle the last few times, so I'm glad we don't have to see them again. <laughs> I'm backing up what you said. Uh, again, Mohammed says, uh, Newcastle won't go anywhere without a proper business model and strategy. A lot of money doesn't mean money well spent, but I'm just sorry. I mean, I think these are big investing guys, big, big like you just said, those companies that they've invested in. Mm -hmm. They're shrewd with their money. Mm -hmm. They don't just go and throw. I don't think they ain't coming into this. They're gonna have a plan, and they're yeah, gonna put people in place to try and execute that plan. Yeah, I mean, you're naive if you think these guys aren't coming in to play a serious and, and not take over, and to think that they're not gonna have a director of football in place, someone at each level to take Newcastle to the next level. You, you, you're silly if you think that's the case because. We have been linked with loads of different directors of football, but there'll be the correct people in place. They'll be drawn up this business model. I mean, this takeover has been going on since January. So if you think they haven't got a plan in place to reach the next level, you're not you're not in a realistic world, to be honest with you, I think, because the world will be, be coming straight in with a, with a game plan, just like Man City did. Um, Guna Gamer TV says, uh, Robbie, we need to say our prayers and take <laughs> our vision. Uh, like song goes, um, there may be tr like the song goes, there may be trouble ahead. I mean, certainly now there's going to be a lot of um, a lot of teams in the Premier League that have got a lot of money to spend. So if, if I go for it, obviously you've got the the obvious ones in Man United, Manchester City, Liverpool are right up there. They're doing well, so they'll have a lot of money to spend. Chelsea, always with Abramovich, um, Everton. Who's got the owners? You know, their owners are the guys who were at Arsenal. That they've got a lot of money. They're multi-billionaires as well. Yeah, Wolves have got billionaire owners. Um, you know what? Most of these clubs, even Tottenham, have got billionaire owners. Arsenal have got billionaire owners. Leicester have got billionaire owners. Now Newcastle. I mean, real clubs with a lot of money to spend. Um, is it going to make the Premier League more competitive? Because, I mean, despite the money this year, we've seen uh, Liverpool just run away with things. But mm. do you think it's going to make the league more competitive? I mean, I think Liverpool are, are going to have that little spell of maybe this season and next, where you see that little era in different sports of, of teams taking over for a bit. Um, I mean, I don't know if you're watching the last dance at the minute, but you've got the Bulls doing that at that point. Liverpool's time will go, and I think everybody will have a, a, a bite at the apple soon because I think, how long are Man City going to keep Pep Guardiola before he gets another challenge or, or wants a bit of time off again? And then I think the money's going to come in where everybody's going for it. And I think that's why Arsenal should be worried, Robbie, because there's only four places for Champions League. And you look around and you see all these clubs. I mean, Spurs aren't doing as well as they should be. Chelsea are in a transitional period on a Lampard. You've got Man United who are in the, in the middle of nowhere with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. God knows what's happening with them. And then you've got Liverpool and City at the top. And you've got teams like us and Everton and Wolves. Even Sheffield United, they've got Saudi owners, by the way, uh, quite wealthy owners. 
You've got West Ham, who always seem to spend 50 million on a player each year and get nowhere. So there's potential for the top six, top eight to get so tight and so competitive. And I think that's why the Premier League will welcome this investment and this ownership to Newcastle because it will bring more exciting, competitive edge to the game. Yeah, yeah. For you, not for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, Manny Wright says, if Newcastle are sensible, they should go after lesser teams and, and better players like Gre Grealish, Aarons, mm -hmm. Tchaikovsky, uh, uh, Burnley, uh, Rice, Diop, um, then bring in the top players. Yeah, I think Max Aaron's at right back is a great shout from Norwich. Great young player. Um, Declan Rice in the middle of the park would be phenomenal. So I think that's the that's the key. Like we said about Man City, you pickpocket the teams around you to get rid of that competitive edge. So if you've got West Ham trailing behind you, take Declan Rice off. They're not a threat anymore. Take someone else off. They're not a threat anymore. Callum Wilson from Bournemouth, England international goal scorer. A new, new challenge for him up north. You know, that that's where you start. And then you, you bring in one or two Mark Usainers and you build from there. Um, self paid says, uh, hate our weak investment in the transfer window. Arsenal needs to take a serious step to challenge for. Maybe, you know what, maybe this might spark Arsenal or spark Stan Kroenke into realizing that he will no longer be able to get away. Well, I've, I've, you know what, even without Newcastle getting his money, I think yeah, he's I mean realizing already that he has to invest because. Last summer, he did invest more than what he normally does. But the yeah. key to Arsenal is to try and get into that Champions League. And we're far away from it at the moment. It may take you dropping out of a European spot for him to give him the kick up the arse he needs to invest more. Mm. Um, John says uh, some, of, some of our Arsenal fans are craving of getting their own. Money ain't a thing. Right? He says, sugar daddy, get a grip. So he's not... He's not feeling that. There are a lot of there are a lot of people, and I don't know if you if you've got them um, at Newcastle, um, but there are a lot of fans who don't like. Even I've spoken to Man City fans who've been like, you know what, I preferred it before the money came, because now I don't feel like it's my club no more. I don't feel I just mm. feel like it's just a money machine now. It's you know the heart and soul of the club's gone out of it. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, I, you're right. To my club anymore, but then you speak to others that are like, Yeah, yeah, I have games, mate. We're winning everything. Uh, hey, I'm sick of getting relegated, uh, to be honest with you. So let's bring some FA Cups. <laughs> you, you have it, you have we have it as well. Quite a few times whenever we report on the takeover, you'll have comments on our Instagram and Twitter saying, I don't want us to turn into a touristy club. You know, I don't want us to, I don't want to not be able to get a ticket for my kid on the weekend because someone's traveled from Australia, someone's traveled from America, someone's traveled from Africa to watch Newcastle United play because they've seen them on telly. You know what I mean? So you can understand that. The want the you traditions of the club. You will get that big time. Big time, Robbie. I mean, there's, there's talks of the want to extend St. James Park, these new owners, potentially look at building a new stadium. Um, I think they'll need that because Newcastle sold 52,000 seats in the championship, full capacity. You know, yeah. at bloody anyone at home, you know, Plymouth at home, full capacity. So imagine if we get the Champions League. Imagine Barcelona at home again. I've seen him as part like the great Sir Bobby Robson days. So if we get to that point, there's going to be a ton of fans. It's going to be ridiculously hard to get away tickets, season tickets, because like you say, we will turn into a tourist attraction. We will be on European TV, on African TV, on Asian TV. If the highlights on us and we do start signing these Mark U world-class players. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all changed at Newcastle, man. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you, uh, Alexander says, uh, hello, Robbie and Matty, Alan Shearer or Thierry Henry? Put your hand down, man. Put your hand down. <laughs> Shearer. Matty. There's the only one, Robbie. There's the only one. Thierry Shearer Henry. all day. Who's, who's the record goals from the Premier League, Robbie? Take the penalties out of it and then... Bollocks. Because <laughs> <laughs> Henri passed his penalties, Robbie. Yeah, if, he, if he didn't pass them to Perez, he'd make it who scored some. Take the penalties out, man. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> nah, be a, I think Shira, best English strike ever. Henri, best foreign import ever. Have it that way. Yeah, we'll settle it at that. We'll settle it at that. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. Remember, um, famously, a lot of people kind of criticise Shira and say, you know, you could have went to a big club. You could have went. Yeah. In Won years, that might be, that talk might be the other way around with these Saudi owners. Yeah, but exactly. And I imagine. You say, why did you go to United? You could have went to Newcastle. <laughs> You'd have won the Champions League. You would have... <laughs> Incredible. This, that That's money, what we'll see. 
everything, isn't it? It's gonna, it's gonna. That's what they'll say to Jack Grealish when he turns Newcastle down for Old Trafford, and then two years time, Man United are stuck in twelfth in Newcastle in the Champions League. <laughs> um, Reedy Schooner says, "Buy El Nini, a great player for sixty million. Sixty million. <laughs> He's taking a piece. <laughs> no one die. I don't need El Nini, likes. Like. <laughs> um, Sandre uh, Mini says, uh, "I'm happy for Newcastle. They deserve it." But so do we, Robbie. We deserve better than Kroenke. And He's right. Yeah. The most annoying thing, the most annoying thing with the Stan Kroenke thing is that Stan Kroenke is not Mike Ashley. When I say Mike Ashley, I mean in terms of money. Mm. He's not. He's um. He's rich. He's stinking rich as well. He may not have the money that the Saudis have got, but he's. <laughs> his way, I think he's worth more than Abramovich. So why why did he buy the club and what does he want from it? Why is he not investing? You're asking me. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to know as well. We all want is to he know. Ha- is he like Mike, Mike Ashley in terms of he never communicates with the fan base? No, he's, he never ever. Well, listen, I I I'd argue that Mike Ashley has had better communication with Newcastle fan base than Stan Kroenke because, as you said in the early days, I remember famously he'd be there, he'd have a pint, and to be fair to him. Even with all the stick he got off of you guys, right? He still went to games, didn't he? Not every game, but you still see him at games. Yeah, yeah now, now and again, I right? don't know because you guys would be. I, I've been to a couple of games and you're shouting all kinds of obscenities at him, and, and he's still there, but he'd be still at games, yeah? Mm. Mike Cronky doesn't go to games. He, he might go to the FA Cup final or he might come to one, maybe two games a year if you're lucky. He wasn't at the final of the uh, Europa League last year in Baku. He didn't come. Crazy. So, honestly, I mean, whereas Mike Ashley, if you would have been in the final, he would be there. And as I said, yeah. he was many a game, wasn't he? And he, and so, I, I will. You, you know, the owner of Arsenal, he's very elusive. He doesn't, he doesn't come. And hence why a lot of fans have the impression of him of a person that doesn't care, rightly mm. or wrongly, but that's how they feel because... He just doesn't connect with the fans. He d- he never speaks to the fans. He never, you know what I mean. So I don't understand why these why these foreign owners come in. Well, it's clearly because Arsenal have a worldwide uh, fan base, don't they? So they're, they're taking it for the profits. But you'd think if, if you're going to come in, you're going to spend that time, energy, and effort and money. You'd want to do the best for the club, wouldn't you? Just the world right now. He doesn't even come to come to games. He, he mustn't even enjoy football if he's not even at the games. That's what a lot of us can't work out. Well, I don't know if he likes football. I really don't. No, uh, honestly, you see, we can't work it out. Um, Stephen O'Connor says, um, I'm happy for Newcastle, but this is a three-year project at least. Biggest players um, may not want to waste three years. Um, Skidmark Comedy says, um, I look out for Arsenal and Coventry City, um, both with worse owners than Mike Ashley. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Coventry have had a tough time of it, trust yeah. me. And, Feel a bit sorry for them because they could have been promoted this season and their league could possibly not con- continue. Um, this guy says, uh, an analytical platypus says, uh, Kroenke bought the club after seeing how high, how the inflation was going on in football so that he could sell it at a higher price after a few years on a profit. But obviously, I just look at it and say there must be no signs of him wanting to sell it because number one, he 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 could have sold it to Usmanov, mm. who, again, is a multi-billionaire and wanted to buy it, was desperate to buy it, was always, you know, even put in a final offer of nearly $2 billion, and that was still turned down. So he doesn't want to sell. But, like, like I don't know what his end game is. I don't know what his ambition... You'll, you'll probably have to wait for, for a moment like this where, where Mike Ashley's been forced to sell. I don't think Mike Ashley's still wanting to sell Newcastle. I really don't. But because of the pandemic and that his retail store is shutting down and the lack of money coming in on a daily, weekly basis, he's been forced to finally give it away. Because he was—I mean, last year he wanted 380 million. That's why the 340 million didn't go through, and now he's getting near 300 million because of the current financial crisis. So maybe you'll have to wait until a situation like that, or hopefully that African guy you talked about comes in in 2021. Sure. Well. It, as I said, uh, yeah, I've, but I think the difference here is that, the, you know, these guys have recently strengthened their investment, mm. you know. So it doesn't seem like there's any signs that they are looking 
to sell. It just looks that, you know. Um, yeah. Big, um, sorry, Big Morgan says, uh, poor Arsenal, it's 20 years since you were the best team in London. Never mind, <laughs> English Dreamers. I bet that's one of your lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a Spurs fan, isn't it? Well, when, what was the, he can't be a Spurs fan because when was the last time they won anything? If Maybe Chelsea. 20, if it's 20 years for us, how many years has it been for them? Yeah, uh, maybe Chelsea. Uh, Robbie, Chelsea, Man City rose to the top, chucking money. But Liverpool became the best team in England, Europe, by smart investment. Arsenal need to take heed because they haven't invested well. I mean, investment, obviously, investment and running the team properly is also a very, very... It's not just about the amount of money that you throw at it. I'm just saying that these... I think there's a very some people I've seen with a very naive view that they're just going to come in. They've got a load of money. They don't know what they're doing. So they invest in a lot of things already. You know, mm. I, you know, yeah. they, they're going to be. I mean, they're going to have a plan. He's right there with with Liverpool. It didn't happen overnight. I think bringing Klopp in was a great appointment. He 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 had a three five year plan. He's getting there now. Mm. But you kind of see they haven't pumped in money. They spent 150 million on a goalkeeper and a defender which ultimately has won them the league. So 150 million on two players isn't cheap, is it? Yeah. Um, last couple we're going to do here because we're running out of time on the show and it's been brilliant. It's just flown past tonight. Uh, Cameron Findlay says, all right, lads. He says, Matty, would you be happy if our owners built a new stadium if they can't expand? Um, St. James Park is in the ideal location. I think it's super tricky because Newcastle, St. James Park in Newcastle, it's we call it the cathedral on the hill. It's very rare as a city centre location stadium. It's great for everyone, home fans, away fans, easy accessible, pubs all around it. It looks beautiful. It's an amazing stadium, great atmosphere on its day. But we're going to be stuck with 52,000 because, like I say, we sell out 52,000 in the Championship. If we're fighting for the Premier League, if we're in the Champions League, even the Europa League, a Thursday night to, a, to, to bloody Batu, you know, Carabag, we'd, we'd sell it out. So we'd, we'd need a bigger stadium, to be honest. And I've been to Spurs' stadium. You won't want to hear this at Robbie and Arsenal fans, but it's an incredible stadium. And if you can get a modern stadium like that, maybe it's the way to go. Okay, okay. It's not an increase, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> They've got paints that fill up in two seconds. It's incredible, the Geordies. Yeah, yeah, the beer thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, finally, this is the final one for the night. It's Hat7. He says, why couldn't the Saudis just buy us? It would have been easier. Bigger club, bigger fan base. We're just cursed. <laughs> <laughs> Matty, listen, thank you very much for coming on tonight. And um, listen, good luck with the future. Um, and uh, yeah, no doubt <laughs> we'll probably be discussing this again. Um, and yeah. tell everybody where they can catch you guys. Uh, please subscribe to the Magpie Channel TV on YouTube. And it's at the Magpie Channel on Instagram and at Magpie Channel underscore on Twitter. Cheers, Robbie. Appreciate it, mate. Yes, mate. I've, I've got a feeling the Magpie Channel is going to be a very exciting place to be um, in the coming years. Um, thank you, Matty, and thanks a lot to everybody. Um, thanks for watching, and we'll be back in the morning with the early edition. <laughs>